So this um, is an extract from a book I've almost finished. It's not really related to the conference that begins uh, from this evening, so excuse me for not really talking about anything non-human at all, except as an art historian, art historians dealing with things which are non-human. <laughs> they are objects, and I'd like to begin by thinking about um, uh, an object and its uh, movement, and then use that as a way of looking at the first English encounters with, um, with Japan, which begin 1611, the first ship is sent. It arrives in Japan 1613. The second ship to be sent arrives in 1616, so that's the period I've taken. In the whole course of this early period, uh, there were only ever three English voyages to Japan. Uh, other than that, there were inter-Asian voyages, um, and my book will deal with those. But today I've kind of sort of shrunk it, brought it together with something which I hope will be interesting and meaningful. Now, is this the... Um, how do I move the... Oh, I see this one here, yes. Sorry, thank you. Th this stays here, right? Okay. So then, um, let's begin. Uh, is it... Why, I hope you can see all right. Uh, I happen to go to a... Um, stately home, right, a country house in, in, in England, which uh, is not that well known, but it's not very far from Padstow, in other words, fairly near to Plymouth, uh, in the southwest of the country. And I went as a simple tourist, and I encountered an object there, which really began me thinking about um, lots of things. Uh, some of you possibly have origins in the southwest of England. If you do, you may know that Screech is a Devonshire name. Uh, and if you're really posh, uh, from well, in many, Dev many, many Devon names end in an O sound. Uh, so the town of Truro, famous historian of Japan called Harold Belitho. These are all very West Country names. And if you're a rather working class type person, you spell it with an O on the end. But if you're rather posh, you spell it E-A-U-X. <laughs> right? So it's just called Prido. And the Prido family have had this house since um, before, the, before 1600. Parts have been changed over time, and I just went as a regular old tourist to take a look and see um, how, how it might be interesting. And I came across this object inside. They knew that it was something quite special. They uh, said it, well, they were correct in saying it's Japanese, but it doesn't really look Japanese. For a start, the shape is not remotely Japanese. And although you do find Japanese mother-of-pearl inlay on objects, you hardly ever see it in this kind of don't know how you describe it, a kind of round-topped triangle sort of thing um, pegged or pinned in to the surface. Uh, so it begins as a very heterodox and, 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 and strange object. The family say uh, it washed up after the Armada. In other words, 1588, and the Mar Armada is such a crucial thing in English history uh, in, and, uh, and the mythology of it, particularly that uh, on the eighth day of the eight, eighth month of 1588, just as the English nation was about to be destroyed by the Spanish, God sent a wind and destroyed uh, the Spanish fleet. And a Armada medal was struck uh, with the logo legend, uh, he blew with his winds and they were scattered. It so happens that this object cannot have arrived with the Armada. For a start, it doesn't float. <laughs> uh, and secondly, it's actually a little bit later than 1588, and to have arrived in, on a Spanish in 1588, it had to be made about 1570. It's not quite that old, but it is around about 1600, 1610. An anecdotal aside with relation to the Armada, 1588, is that 8888 was the uh, defeat of the Spanish, but on the 101088, not even two months later, the first Japanese arrived in England. And they did come on a Spanish ship. They didn't float in like this box is supposed to have done. They were captured by an um, English vessel, not too far away from here, actually, much further down the coast in, off what's today uh, Mexico, and they were brought to England. And they, of course, had to have been told immediately about the Armada and the destruction of the much superior Spanish fleet by an act of God. And those uh, two Japanese who arrived w have Christian names, so we presume that they were Roman Catholics converted by the Spanish. Possibly they were encouraged to embrace the Church of England. We know that they lived in England for uh, three or four years and became fluent in English, and much to the amazement of the English people, enjoyed eating English food. 
Eventually, they were taken back to Japan, and very sadly, they never made it back to Japan. They were both shipwrecked and died along the way. However, they were referred to as boys of good character. That means to say that they were educated. They weren't simple um, sailors. Had they been sailors, they probably would have been ignored. But because they were boys of good character and they were literate, they were introduced into English polite society. And not being a historian of England, I work on Japan. I've been trying to encourage people who work on this. Is there any remote evidence that these uh, Japanese boys, uh, who did they meet? They were in India for three years. And um, arriving with them was also a Filipino boy who disappears from the record immediately. He's not regarded as good character. In other words, he's not literate. But we know that he, was, uh, he entered the service of the Countess of Leicester, after whose son Leicester Square in London is made. And the Countess of Leicester was the first person who had the idea of having herself painted with a dark-skinned person to show off her beautiful white skin. No painting of her survives next to anything that could be a Filipino boy, much less next to a Japanese boy. Um, but there are uh, documentary references to her having been painted with blackamoors, probably um, Arabs. So something is happening very internationally at this time in the end of the um, Elizabethan period. Is it even possible that Elizabeth I could have met the Japanese boys? It is possible because they were brought back by the great uh, uh, sailor maritime discoverer uh, Cavendish. uh, And Cavendish's sister was at court. So it's entirely possible. Regrettably, we don't know. We don't know something else which is equally fascinating, perhaps even more fascinating, is that when the Japanese boys heard about the destruction of the Spanish fleet by an act of God who blew with his winds and they were scattered, did they think about the Japanese kamikaze? Because Japan hasn't exactly the same image, uh, the same myth, that when the Mongols attacked Japan, in fact more than once, uh, they were destroyed by an unseasonable storm. And if you Google the English Protestant wind, they called it, that destroyed the Spanish. If you Google Protestant wind, upcomings next to it, the word kamikaze. These two things were very closely linked. The boys never made it back, but the English voyages, which I'll be talking about to you today, uh, took with them people who had even fought at the Spanish Armada. After all, it was a naval battle. People sailing to Japan uh, were very likely to have had some sort of Armada experience. One of the first Englishmen who remained in Japan and indeed died there had been the captain of a small ship at the Spanish Armada. He would surely have told many Japanese people about this Protestant wind and the Japanese would surely have thought to themselves, it's just like us. Now the Japanese were involved with uh, Christianity so that anything to do with the destruction of the Spanish fleet and particularly the problematization of Spain as merely one European power and not the only great European power, which, of course, how the Iberians were presenting themselves all across Asia, never mind just in Japan. The existence of a different country, a smaller one, an island nation, that had a slightly different interpretation of God, who had supported them against the might of Spain, would have been something of significant interest to the Japanese who were wondering themselves quite how wise they were to permit the free movement of missionaries, mostly Jesuits, also some Franciscans and Dominicans, across their own territories. Eventually, the um, Spanish and the Portuguese would be expelled from Japan, uh, and the date on which they are expelled is a very important, but I'll come back to that in a minute, so I don't want to give the game away now. So let's return to this object. It emblematizes a movement of goods and people and ships, things, money, round about 1600. Um, There's a little further clues towards it and towards its uh, interest. If it's set today against the wall, as you can see it, on a modern-day stand. The actual object is possibly about, not quite as long as this table, but nearly, and... um, about a little bit wider. If you pull it away from the wall, you can see the back of it. And the back... Sorry, Josh, I'm going to be sitting down. The back of it looks like this. The back of it is regular Japanese lacquer. This is how we can say, well, it certainly is a Japanese object. Even though 
the inlay is not Japanese, and the shape is not Japanese. So first of all, what is the shape? Let me jump back. I'm sorry I put those two things. I'll come back for a second. Uh, the, the shape is your regular pirate's chest. If any of you have children or nephews and nieces or remember your own childhood, we all had these pirate stories, Long John the Silver, 15 men on a dead man's chest. A chest always looks like this. It always has a round top. So why, I don't have any you know, thing with a round top. Why do you have a round top? It's a Portuguese design, completely a Portuguese design, uh, and it's very clever. It's, if you, I travelled first class for the first time ever in my life a little while ago, and what happens is your bag is the last one that goes onto the plane, and the first one that comes off, you don't waste any time hanging around for it. If you have a rounded top, nothing can ever be put on top. Your bag is the last one that goes in, and it'll be the first one that comes off. So the elite people had this shape to demonstrate privilege right, and to obtain privilege. Uh, and, of course, on a ship, it doesn't just mean last on, first off. It's the least likely to get damaged with any water that will seep into the boat, as, of course, always happened on ships. And if it's a beautiful chest like this, of course, it's not just for carrying normal merchandise. It's going to be whoever the commander of the voyage is, his best things. Possibly that means clothes. It might mean documents. It doesn't mean large amounts of ceramics or silver or something you wouldn't put them into a into a case like this so we have a portuguese elite travelers object you don't have it today it's sitting in a in a country house but it was it's a traveling object it's a sea seaborne object not a domestic thing so then what about the inlay uh, i just gave the game i did give the game away stupidly by putting the slides in the wrong order but that comes from gujarat north india the First Europeans to arrive in India, of course, they uh, uh, round the Cape and they go to um, uh, um, uh, the northwest of India. The Mughals have their great port at Surat in Gujarat. And the Mughals, of course, uh, high court culture, very uh, excellent um, uh, um, material artifacts of all kinds. And long before anyone's got to Japan, they're bringing Mughal things back to Europe and people will be admiring them. And the Mughals do a great deal of this mother of pearl inlay with a, with a little nail to hold it in place. It has a, a raised top. In this case, I don't think it's in order to be able to, to stop anything being put on top because it's got legs. You wouldn't probably put anything on top anyway, but a raised top of just allows you to put a bit more stuff into it. All right. I suspect that's what it is. So we have a Portuguese shape uh, for maritime use and an Indian box. And we have a midway point here because now we have an Indian inlaid box made in Japan. This doesn't have the Portuguese element to it. It's not a big trunk for moving around a ship. It's a small thing you probably keep in your cabin. So it doesn't require the rounded top, but it has a raised top just so that you can fit more stuff in. Uh, this is today in a collection in, in the USA, but probably there's many of them. They would have been in various places. The Mughals could perfectly well have commissioned this themselves from the Japanese court, and there's lots of evidence of direct Mughal um, commissions to Japan, especially for lacquer. The Mughals didn't send their own ships. They're always having to commission via the Dutch or the Spanish, but the, they often send models made in India uh, to be sent to Japan to be uh, produced. The governor of Bengal, who's one of the most senior people in the Mughal hierarchy after the emperor himself, um, rode around um, Dhaka, now the capital of Bangladesh, but then was the capital of Mughal uh, Bengal. Uh, he rode around in a Japanese-made lacquer palanquin. Uh, so, uh, this is all perfectly possible, but in the, li the most likelihood is that, that a Dutch or a Spanish or a Portuguese, something's gone to, to move this object uh, from place to place. Um, so, there we have the, uh, the Japanese bit, and I suspect what happened is that whoever commissioned this said, I want this shape, I want this, uh, the, this, this, this uh, design, this ornamentation on the front, but like, nobody really thought to say, what about to do at the back? So the Japanese lacquerer in Kyoto just went into default mode and did whatever he would normally do. So the back is totally standard Japanese stuff. And nobody told him what to do with the inside either. So when you opened up, it's totally standard Japanese uh, design inside it as well. A pair of cranes flying around in, um, uh, in, in, a, in a black lacquered 
surface ornamented with gold and silver. Very frequently in Japan, you have this gold ornamentation uh, on lacquer. Lacquer is an expensive thing, uh, probably actually more expensive than the gold. But the gold will make it iridescent and, and beautiful, of course. The logic of that shape I already explained. The logic of the inlay is probably because it's fairly sturdy. And if it gets bashed, as might well happen with a case that's uh, being moved around in a ship, you can replace the little bits of lacquer. I mean, you t have a sack of spare parts with you and nails, and you can repair it yourself or have your servants repair it as it's being used. The logic of Japanese lacquer, though, is uh, something totally different, and that's its lightness. Right? Japanese lacquer is almost feather light. And to have a trunk of this size made out of oak, for example, you'd need two people to carry it. But to have it made out of lacquer, you can lift it almost with one hand. And if the contents are clothes, which are not heavy, right, then to have this amazingly light thing uh, is just stunning and wonderful and, 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 and convenient. It also doesn't hurt on a ship to keep uh, the cargo fairly light. The first evidence uh, that I've found of anyone discussing these things in English, and again, as a historian of Japan, I'm not hugely familiar with you know, Spanish records from this period or Portuguese ones, but uh, a building which I will return to at the end of my talk called the New Exchange. If you know London, then you will know uh, Trafalgar Square, of course, and next to it is the railway station uh, Charing Cross. And just on from Charing Cross, you've probably never noticed it, there is a top shop uh, and, and a pizza hut in one building. And they have today the exact same footprint of a building called the New Exchange which was built in 1609 with a specific intention of selling newly imported objects, which would have included Asian ones. No ships yet gone to Japan, but plenty of ships have gone to India. In any case, you can get Asian objects through Amsterdam or through Venice. And it's built in that spot along the Strand by Trafalgar Square. It's midway between the court in Westminster and the rich merchants in the city of London. So the new exchange was built to be a new... Uh, experience of consumption for wealthy people regardless of class. At any rate, when the new exchange was officially opened in 1609, the king himself is invited to attend. J Elizabeth I is dead. J king James I is invited to attend with his wife, uh, the daughter of the king of Denmark. The king of Denmark was the first person who ever invented having an Indian room in his palace in Copenhagen. had just been built at this time. Uh, which, of course, Indian meant all things further away than the Arab countries, uh, and also attended by their son, um, who was intended to be King Henry IX, but he died, so we never got a King Henry IX. But he attended, the, and at the opening of the new exchange, an actor comes on, actually a very famous actor from the period, post-Shakespeare period, and he acts the part of a Chinaman. A Chinaman means a person who sells Chinese goods, not a Chinese person. And the Chinaman narrates this amazing ramble about all these amazing things we're getting in from overseas now. Chinese things, he refers to Indian things, he refers it to things which probably didn't come from this far west in, in the North American continent, but certainly things which would have been identified by them, by us, as Canadian artifacts, robes made of feathers, for example. Uh, and uh, he says, as one of these amazing objects, trunks which are so heavy, you can't, so wide, you can't even touch the bottom of them, and yet you can pick up with one hand. And that has to mean Japanese lacquer cases. So that's why people wanted them. So my kind of starting out point with what eventually became a book, which hopefully, hopefully will be republished in a year's time, was this um, case. So Mr. Prido will get a free copy of the book when it comes out. But then looking a bit further, of course, this supposedly washed up, it didn't. But uh, uh, things were going around not just because they went around. Ships had to be financed, commanded, sailed competently, uh, and they had to go with goods that would sell at the point of arrival to the extent that you could then buy a cargo to bring back. We're not talking about pillage of areas. The Spanish, unfortunately, did a lot of that. The English are fully aware right from the start that they are not going to be able to take anything by gunpoint, certainly the Mughal Empire and also the Japanese Empire, much stronger than any little English ship or two turning up could ever be. So they're going to have to sell things in order to buy things. 
and the um, this begins. Okay, sorry, I'm jumping for lack of time. This begins with this figure called Sir Thomas Smith. I know in uh, there's in the main street in Vancouver, one of the main streets is called Smythe, right? Spelt with an I, but we probably pronounce his name Smith because uh, on the print it actually says Smith M I T H S M I T H. Uh, but also the family writer, and the family still existed there, they call it the red writer, but they pronounce it Smith. Any case, it doesn't matter. But he was the, um, probably the richest man in England at the time, outside the aristocracy. Uh, his father, also called Thomas Smith, was certainly the richest man in England at the time, and his wife's father was probably the second richest man at the time. It was a very good marriage. And they inherited London's largest private house. He invested in everything. So whatever was going and you needed capital... Thomas Smith, and then subsequently Sir Thomas Smith, was the one to go to. It doesn't surprise anyone, therefore, that when they begin thinking about the creation of a dedicated body that will sail beyond the Cape, beyond the Arab lands, uh, Sir Thomas Smith is invited to become a major contributor, and he also becomes the governor of the company, the head of the company, and the company is called the Company of Merchants of, Merchants of London Sailing into the East Indies, for short, the East India Company. The Dutch were already sailing into the Indies. The Spanish and the Portuguese, of course, were doing it too. But the, none of them had founded a unitary monopoly organization. So this is the East India Company. In Japanese history, the Dutch East India Company would be more important in the long term. But, and indeed, it got to Japan earlier, but it was founded later. So Sir so Thomas Smith um, begins the assembly of capital to ascend off to Japan, and the company is given its accreditation by Queen Elizabeth, still Queen Elizabeth, in um, the last year of, last day of 1600, 31st of January. Uh, and um, they gather out 2,000 pounds or something, they, 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 they buy off, they lease old ships, they don't create their own ships, uh, and uh, off they sail. And that early history of the company, uh, effectively, they're not yet going to India, they're certainly not get yet going as far as Japan. It's really a spice-making, spice-buying organization. They go to find the Spice Islands, which uh, may sound a very long way to go just for spices, because it's modern-day Indonesia. But one has to remember that spices, first of all, of course, they make insipid and tasteless Dutch and English and Scottish food more palatable. But also, spices were regarded as medicinal especially mace. Right? Mace is the membrane between the nut and the shell of nutmeg. It was the world's most valuable thing by weight. And to this day, if they go to the supermarket and buy a nutmeg, it's amazing, like $8 just for a little nutmeg. Right? Still, it's tremendously expensive. We think it's nice tasting, but they thought it was a cure for plague. And plague is still current in Europe. So Thomas Smith himself would die of plague in 1685. When King James I comes down to London to assume kingship from Scotland, he can't get into the city for eight months because of plague. And uh, plague, of course, was terrible because, well, it wasn't terrible. I mean, it was terrible, but the thing is that if you're an affluent person, it's terrible because many diseases are associated with poverty. The best way out of poverty, the best way out of disease, it's the same today, right, is to be rich. But plague hits anyone. Right. The queen can die of it. Uh, so that plague is especially terrifying to wealthy people who have the money to spend on anything that will cure them. And they will even send ships beyond Java to buy nutmeg. And that's what the East India Company does. They also buy pepper and um, bring them back for sale. Uh, the area in which this is done... so. Uh, obviously, you know what this is. India, Ceylon, Sri Lanka. So you sail just the tip of Africa here. And you go right across and you come to here, um, uh, uh, Bantam. This is now, of course, Java. And they don't grow spices there, although they do grow pepper up here. But you can go through and you can sail to these islands around here where spice, uh, where, where nutmeg is actually grown. Nutmeg is very, very hard to grow. Right? This is the only place that can grow it. But initially, Bantam is a very good port, and it's sufficient to buy things there. It's going to be much cheaper than buying them in, in, in Istanbul or Venice or Amsterdam. So it's worth doing that. It's, it would take some time before they say to themselves, this is a very long voyage and a somewhat dangerous one. Why don't we go up and stop in India and do some trading first? 
and that the whole Mughal thing begins at that point, and then you come down. Well, from, from Bengal on this side, you can go down and you go right through here, except you can't because the Portuguese control the Straits of Malacca. No English or Dutch ship will be permitted to get through. Very narrow. All you need is a big fort on one side and you can bombard any ship and you'll sink it. So the English and the Dutch cannot begin trade at all until they discover and cultivate the only second way through. Right? Because really from Europe to Java is perfectly easy. I mean, there's, there's winds obviously to deal with. There's no rocks or anything. But to go through here is almost impossible because there's only two little tiny slots. They knew about this already. It was a long time before anyone discovered the second route. So the English and Dutch use this one. They cultivate the local sultan and uh, he allows them to either buy at his markets here or eventually, as time would come, to sail through. And this is uh, the objective of the East India Company. It's our map. They didn't have a map like that. They had a map like this. Slightly later, but effectively it's the same thing. We have India and then uh, Africa, India, and then you sail through, and then you go uh, to Spice Islands, and eventually you just simply go due north, and you get um, to Japan. And then they begin thinking about Japan. Already they know Japan makes wonderful lacquer. Wonderful lacquer sells for vast amounts of money. The problem is lacquer also costs vast amounts of money. So that lacquer is a beautiful thing that is loved all across uh, wealthy people in Europe, but you can't make any money out of dealing in it because it costs so much to buy at source. So it really only works as presents and bribes. Um, the East India Company can't survive on that. Japan, Japan comes into its own for an entirely different reason. Uh, as well as producing lacquer, it produced silver. Right? Half of all the silver ever mined on Earth came from Japan. The other half came from round about modern day Peru and of course Argentina named for that reason. The English are desperate for silver because in the days of Queen Elizabeth when England had been at war with Spain and Spain is bringing silver back from Latin America to Seville all you've got to do is attack a Spanish ship and take the silver and it's free. Uh, and that's wonderful. right? But once peace comes in James I brings peace uh, you can't do that anymore. Of course, you can buy the Spanish sh silver from them and trade it, but then you, you know, your, your markup's not going to be very good. So the East India Company is seeking an alternative source of silver because that's what they use to buy the spices in Java. Right? The Javanese are very accustomed to selling, silver, selling spices for silver. They've been doing it for other people, and that's what they sell it to the Arab traders. So silver is absolutely fine. Need another place to get silver. So this is the East India Company's one of their um, issues. Japan will provide us with silver. But they have um, another issue, which is that until they can get Japanese silver, it's not going to come overnight, until they can get Japanese silver, they're going to have to sell something else to buy the spices. Well, England happened to have one, one and only world-class export item at this time, which was wool. Right? To this day, one half of all sheep in the EU are in England. Most of the other half are in Greece. Um, so wool remains, remained and remains very important uh, for English um, export, not to mention the fact you also sell it. So it's fine. So the, the ship turns up in Java with a cargo of English wool high quality, and they'll say, let's swap this for spices. The Javanese say, uh, we love your wool, very interesting wool, but have you noticed it's 35 degrees outside? Uh, and we think we'll buy some of it for use as elephant blankets. Uh, and so this is not a very, it's not going to work. Japan comes in here too, because the latitude is such that um, they estimate, no one's yet been there, they estimate that Japan, being about the latitude of England, surely must have about the same climate. And those Japanese who'd been to England after the Armada had already told the English, we don't have any sheep. Japan is completely sheepless, right? No sheep, cold winters, they're bound to want to buy as much wool as the English can sell. Not least because one of the main blunders of this map is Japan is way too big. Right? It's bigger than India. Right? Japan is frequently shown almost 50 times too big on early maps. And, and that, that's because 
no European ship had ever circumnavigated Japan. So the Japanese make perfectly good maps of their own. They get a Japanese map and they stick it onto a European map, but they don't know the scale. Right. So, so they're deluded in this completely. The other um, huge mistake of this map, or not yet discovery, is that, well, they think, um, if we aren't going to take English wool to Japan, pick up Japanese silver with it, and use that silver then to sell, sell to the Javanese, because the Javanese won't buy wool themselves. Why are we going all the way around Africa and India anyway? Let's go over the top of Russia. Because then you can just go from London over here, drop down to Japan, get the silver, go down to Java and come back again. It's much, much quicker. You won't meet any Spanish or Portuguese who might, you know, well, even when peace comes, of course, there's very strong commercial rivalries. Nobody's going to help each other. And there's always the Protestant Catholic issue to deal with as well. So amongst its early activities, while sending ships around India to Java to buy spices, the East India Company also teams up with a preview, previously existing body called the Muscovy Company. So the Muscovy Company had been founded much earlier on to deal, of course, with Moscow, where the English would, of course, sell wool. The Russians bought it with great delight. And they sold the English in exchange furs. This was managed by uh, a group called the Skinner's Company, in London, of which Thomas Smith was also the major investor. So, let's work on in Japanese silver, they think. We'll have to kind of shift a little bit until we eventually get to Japan. But while we're doing that, let's look for that passage over the top of Russia to Japan. Well, you know, of course, um, as people living in Canada, that they're also at the same time trying, trying to go the other direction going over the top of Canada, going up through Hudson Bay, as they foolishly or incorrectly thought. The problem with going over the top of Canada is you're not going to find any friendly cities along the way. You may find friendly people that will exchange things, but you know, if your mask breaks, it's going to be very, very hard. If you go over the top of Russia, then at any rate part of the journey, you will have friendly cities. And don't forget that Russia and England have a very, very long amicable relationship might not think so today, to the extent it's often forgotten that there was some talk that Ivan the Terrible and Elizabeth I would marry. Right. Ivan the Terrible fully expected his marriage proposal to Elizabeth I to be accepted. It, it wasn't, but trade relations are very strong, and if you uh, go to Moscow uh, today, you will know that the oldest building in Moscow outside the Kremlin is the so-called English Court, which was the home of the Muscovy Company building that's there today, slightly after this time, but uh, parts of it date back to about 1630. So the Muscovy Company's been doing plenty of this already. I don't have a map, but you probably have it in your minds, that you would sail through the um, Baltic. In other words, you go around um, the bottom part of Scandinavia, you go past northern Germany, and there's the parts, all the um, Hanseatic ports and lots of wonderful Hamburgan places and you get eventually to the end of that, and then you go by land. Owing to strange marriage politics, the king of Poland, whom the English and the Dutch and the Germans mistrust because he's a very powerful Catholic monarch, he inherits the kingdom of Sweden. So suddenly, both sides of the Baltic are owned by the same king, who is Roman Catholic and who won't let the Germans and the English and the Dutch go through. This is the end, beginning of the end, of the Hanseatic League. Right. The, the, Dutch, the Russians are also very worried that suddenly nobody's going to be coming to trade with them anymore. So they open a new port right in the north, over the top of Scandinavia, at Archangel. Right. Built specifically to accommodate English and Dutch, but also German traders. So the English... Now think, this is it. Archangel, we're already halfway there. From Archangel, surely it's going to be not even a month sailing to get to Japan. So they think we must go and be really, really nice to the Tsar and get, first of all, permission to sail over the top of Russia. Secondly, we must get permission, since we're not going to be going via Africa, permission to bring Mughal and Iranian products, which they still want, and they're not going to go by sea that way in the future, they think. Permission to transport these things 
through Russia without paying tax. It may seem like Iranian things to London via Moscow, but actually there are enough rivers that it does, it, you can do it. Um, and thirdly, ban the Dutch from doing the same thing. Right. And the person who sent to negotiate this with, um, with the Tsar, Boris Godunov, is none other than Sir Thomas Smith, right. who is made Sir Thomas for that purpose. Now here, it, the map will slow, show you slightly. Um, the old way through the Baltic has been closed off, and so you have to go all the way around, and here is Archangel. Of course, it's a very cold port, but it's, it's a very safe one. And from Archangel, you can get to Moscow pretty easily, actually, mostly by river, or if it's frozen, frozen territory actually is really good for travelling because a sledge is much uh, faster and safer than a, a wheeled vehicle. And then they will get permission to go over the top. And in order to uh, charm Boris Godunov, Sir Thomas Smith takes an extraordinary present, a carriage. Carriages are very new things at the time. The first known carriage in England is only from something like 1580. I mean, you know, Henry VIII and people, they never knew about a carriage. They went on horseback. Right? So uh, uh, the latest thing, and this is a vast carriage. It's almost as far as from here to that wall. Uh, and uh, it's, I think I'm right in saying the world's oldest existent carriage. It still sits there in the basement of the Kremlin. Things that go into the Kremlin don't come out. <laughs> so I don't know if they used it, because, uh, but anyway, it's, it's, it's such good conditions. They probably didn't use it. But anyway, it's a, it's a great gift. And, and Boris Godunov uh, celebrated the arrival of Sir Thomas Smith by accepting his three proposals. Yes, you can, use, you, can, you can travel over the top of Russia. Yes, you can bring things from India and Bengal and, and Gujarat through my territory freely. And thirdly, we won't let the Dutch do it. And he lays on an enormous feast to celebrate the arrival of Sir Thomas Smith. The arrival, the feast goes on for so long that Sir Thomas Smith can't take any more. He gets off and he starts to go back to the port, to Archangel. Three days later, he's almost reached the port. Boris Gudunov is still having his dinner. And he falls over and dies with blood rushing from all his orifices. That's the death of Boris Gudunov. However, his body strangely disappeared. Word went around Russia, mostly circulated by the Dutch merchants there, that Boris Gudunov had not died he was fleeing to London with Sir Thomas Smith, taking with him the entire Russian treasury. They thought this because Boris Godunov was, was a usurper, at this point coming towards the end of his life and concerned about his inheritance. This would lead into what is called the period of the Troubles in Russia, huge turmoil, occupation of, the, of, the, um, uh, of Moscow by the Poles, etc., and all things start to get very chaotic. The English, therefore, have a new idea. Since we can't guarantee on the Russian state to allow us to move things from India and Iran through under their Russian policing, we better take the matter into our own hands. Given that Moscow is now under the control of the Poles, why don't we send an English regiment to conquer a part of Russia from Archangel down to Iran and call it the English Corridor, and because we, it'll need a governor general, why don't we send King James's second son? His first son, Henry, will be the next king. His second son, Charles. Prince Charles can go and become a kind of sub-Czar. And James I thinks it's a great idea, and he has an even better idea. We won't send English soldiers. We'll send Irish ones, by which means ridding my lands of the unworthy subjects thereof. Uh, and they all begin planning doing this. Um, that's a story of Russian history. Can't tell it anymore. It didn't come to pass. There never would be an English corridor uh, down to Iran. Never mind. The, uh, Sir Thomas Smith, at any rate, goes back to London with what he asked for, and we begin the sailings. They sail. This is a ship of the period, a model, obviously. We don't exactly know what they were like. Probably they had about 70 or 80 men on board, uh, and uh, not big for us, we'd look at them in terror and think, how, how could you trust your life to that? But for the time, of course, they were the latest vessels. And it's three ships that leave England in 1611, bound for Japan. Now, um, already, just to get the timescale right, 
they've already got the permission to go over Russia, and they're doing that. They're trying to go through and out the other side of Hudson Bay at the same time. They're sending ships back and forth to Java buying spices. But now, 1611, they're going to go on to Japan. For now, they'll have to go via Africa and Java, but they hope that they won't have to do that for too long. As the Russian Tsar had been given a spectacular present of a carriage, so the Japanese, they don't know what to call him. Japan's got to have a ruler. They don't know what he is. They call him the Emperor of Japan. Sometimes they call him the King of Japan. Today, of course, we call him the Shogun. The Shogun has to be given a pretty spectacular present too. Most times when uh, gifts of this kind are being sent, a king-to-king encounter, uh, the East India Company is going to trade, but of course they have to take authorization from the king of England to the Japanese ruler asking, for, you don't just t- turn up in the country and trade there, you have to go via their authorities. So almost always in such counters, encounters, a, a royal portrait will be sent. So you would expect the ship in 1611, bound for Japan, ships, to have on board a portrait of James I. James I famously hated to have his portrait painted. He couldn't sit still for long enough. So there are only about two types of King James's portrait. And one of them was invented by, of course, his uh, royal painter called um, John de Critz. And John de Critz, by 1611, he's still alive. He's very old and he's not painting anymore. But one of his studio probably would have produced something along these lines. This painting happens to be still in London, but they're all over the place. I mean, there's one in Florence, of course there's one in Moscow, there's one in the Prado, uh, and um, who knows if they would not have been one also sent to Japan. Regrettably, there's no documentation, and certainly no um, such portrait exists in Japan today. But slightly later, we know that one went to the Mughal court, and so I think probably one went to Japan, and we know one went to the Mughal court because there is King James, incorporated into a Mughal miniature. The Mughals did this. The Mughals, um, I don't know anything about Mughal art, but what the Europeans say, the Europeans love portraits, right? You send a portrait of somebody. But the Mughals like rather more populated pictures. And so the English Eastern Company eventually would send a letter back to London saying, stop sending us these portraits. Lots of people. That's what the Indians like. Right? <laughs> so so, so he's, it's been copied. And also, of course, the format would be wrong and the colours would be wrong. So a Mughal artist has made something more suitable for consumption within the elite Mughal court in this way. And it's a portrait of the, 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 the emperor of the time, uh, Jahangir, with, uh, who was a great lover of Western art. So there's lots of Western bits, not just James I, but he's putty here and sitting on an hourglass. But it's a lovely title, right? I think the title is... A translation, I'm sorry, I can't even read this, but it's Persian. The, um, the great Mughal prefers the teaching of a Sufi to that of foreign kings. So there is a Sufi handing over a Quran or a Popsa commentary, and here is a, the, the, the Shah of Iran, and here is James I, and here is the painter. So we know one was in India only slightly afterwards. We can speculate one would have gone to Japan. We don't know. But we do know the principal present that was taken. Of course, they could have taken a carriage, since they were high-end, recently invented things. But taking a carriage all the way to Japan would have been really quite a difficult thing to do, and it would take up a vast amount of, um, uh, of, uh, of space in a ship, and they wouldn't even know where the Japanese horses could be trained to, to pull it. So that is not the present. The present is something um, very strange and uh, totally unexpected. Well, I gave it the title of this talk, so it's perhaps not unexpected by you. It was a silver telescope. The telescope was invented, well, there's always arguments there might have been precedents, but the the telescope was patented in uh, Holland in 1607 or Potts 8. The first telescope ever documented in England is at that very same moment at the opening of the New Exchange when the king comes and they have the trunks which are so... You can't. A telescope was shown to the king at that time. That was in May 1609. And this ship left in early 1611. So only two years since the first discovery of a telescope and less than two years since Galileo's amazing findings had been published and thereby changing, although controversially, of course, a whole understanding of astronomy... Um, a telescope to be sent to Japan in some way must be something about 
you know, this is our latest thing, we can do it, it's nice. It's, it was a very large telescope, it was as big as this table, but it was obviously much smaller than a carriage. Uh, so I think this is probably why a telescope was chosen. But it's referred to as silver, or more technically speaking, it's referred to as silver gilt, that is gilded silver. You could make a telescope of silver, but silver is not such a precious metal, probably not a good enough metal for the Emperor of Japan. You could make it out of gold, but gold is too soft. So silver gilt is often used for very, very elite um, presents. It's the first recorded telescope in, in history made to be a presentation item of stand of quality to a royal king. That, Galileo, of course, just had a wooden tube, right? The point was the lens. He didn't care what the thing looked like. So this is something very, very special uh, and different. Uh, this is the sort of thing Galileo might have had. Obviously, it's a re conjectural reconstruction. But we know a little bit about what the one that went j to Japan might have looked like. A slightly later painting by Bruegel in a set of works showing the fa uh, five senses. Taste, touch, whatever. And the one emblematizing sight has a silver telescope in it. It's the earliest depiction of a telescope. I've got a detail for you. I'm sorry, I pressed the wrong thing. Um, the detail of it, it's, it's not very good reproduction, sorry. So it's probably something like this. And the painting's a little bit interesting because if you look at it, it's a very beautifully organized painting, obviously. I mean, it's Bruegel. But that telescope feels to me it's been bunged in a bit later on. And I'd love someone to do an um, X-ray, and I'd love someone to conclude the, the telescope was added in later. It goes over this lady who emblematized vision, it goes over her leg in a very uh, incompetent sort of way, and you'd never have it on the floor. Um, I don't know, but the point is that this is, you know, it's the latest thing, it's, uh, and even this is seven years later than the English one. At any rate, the English uh, get there, they arrive in Japan at uh, a southern port, the kind of place you'd obviously arrive at if you're coming up from Java via the Philippines, uh, not very far from modern-day Nagasaki. And uh, they're told by the local ruler that, you know, we probably they have the polity explained to them. Yes, there is this person called the emperor, but he is uh, f effectively a, a, a kind of sacerdotal clergy-like figure. But we have somebody called the shogun. But actually, the shogun doesn't even really rule because his father's still alive and his father is ruling on his behalf. You better give your best present to the shogun's father. And if you've got a secondary present, please give it to the shogun and you can forget about the emperor. He doesn't really need anything. And so they go to the place where the, emp where the shogun's father is living, at the foot of Mount Fuji, very near to the modern city of Shizuoka. The shogun himself is living in Edo, now Tokyo, which is not the capital then, but is the center. But so that in any case, you have to go through Shizuoka, then called Sumpu, to get to Tokyo. They've got to go through it anyway. And this is the castle that he was living in, much restored today. And this is the building in which the telescope was handed over. Um, now, we know it was received because the Japanese court records refers to the arrival of a telescope. They have no word for a telescope, of course, so they call it a thing for seeing far. Actually, there's no English word for telescope at this point. The word for telescope was settled on by an international conference in Italy in 1611, four or five months after the uh, English ship had gone. They call it a prospective glass. Right? A glass for seeing prospects with, which implies that not only, of course, it's for lunar viewing or, you know, astronomy, but it does have a military function. Telescopes would later on be associated, of course, with um, commanders in the field and, and, and captains on board ship. You can use it for t terrestrial use as well. So the Japanese probably enjoyed using the telescope for seeing. Uh, and Japan is still in a state of civil war at this point. The shogun by no means controls all of Japan. He's still fighting campaigns at which this telescope probably could have been very useful to him. But the telescope, after all, most of all, was useful for uh, astronomy. And the thing which it did in astronomy, I mean, Galileo had many discoveries, but the thing which he discovered which really perturbed people most and changed people's thinking most was that he was able to prove the previously discussed but not really provable theory of heliocentricity. The fact that the sun is stationary and the earth revolves around it. That theory, of course, had been invented, proposed by Copernicus long before. But Copernicus's book is a huge fat book in Latin 
that nobody could ever work out what the hell he's talking about. And it's famously called the book that no one read. Right? A recent study of Copernicus is, is called the book that no one read. Um, and, and, it, and so because nobody read it, nobody quite noticed what it means to say the earth does, the earth, the sun does not revolve around the earth. The earth revolves around the earth. If you say that, you've contradicted scripture. Because in the Bible, it quite specifically says, the book of Joshua, God told him to make the sun stand still. Right? You can't contradict scripture. So Copernicus was actually a Roman Catholic priest, and when he published his book, he'd given a copy to the Vatican. But they hadn't read it, they just put it away. Now with a telescope, anyone using a telescope, on a series of cloudless nights, can tell, yes, the earth does revolve around the sun. In other words, it challenges scripture in a way which was extremely troubling. And that's why eventually Galileo would run into such problems. All his other discoveries, the, loons, the moons around Venus, nobody, you know, that doesn't matter. The Bible has no comments on it. But this thing was very, very problematic. And the, um, the, the Vatican scholar and cardinal who would eventually uh, be the one to condemn Galileo slightly after this time, interesting enough, while Galileo is doing his experimentation, and he's called in to Rome to replicate his findings, the cardinal who's in charge of that, believe it or not, has a Japanese boy living in his house. This is the first Japanese person that I know that arrived in Europe after those two English boys that came to England. His name is Thomas Araki, and he must have been an extremely unusual person because... In Japan, he probably is from the countryside, he sort of wandered into some Jesuit church and says, I want to become a priest. Now, there are some Japanese becoming priests, although unfortunately the Jesuits are very racist about this. On the whole, they didn't allow the Japanese to become priests. They always said it's because their Latin isn't good enough. But, so anyway, they said to him, well, your Latin isn't good enough. He can't become a priest. So what does he do? He just gets on a ship and goes to Rome. And he arrives in Rome about a year later, and he goes to the Jesuit college in Rome, and says, you know, I've come from very far away, can I come in? The head of the Jesuit College of Rome, who is none other than that same cardinal, who's in the process of, 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 of condemning Galileo, says, uh, please come, you know, he's delighted by it. Right? Prove the Jesuits have gone all the way to Japan. Uh, and according to uh, his biographer, it says that the cardinal and Thomas Araki said the Book of Hours together. I was brought up as a nice Church of England boy, so I had no idea what it means to say the, church, say the Book of Hours together. And those of you who come from Roman Catholic backgrounds probably know. But as I understand it, uh, the Book of Hours is said in the privacy of your room, not in a church or chapel. Right. And what this must mean is that this Japanese boy had a very close relationship. You know, whether it was close in an improper way, who could ever say that? But they're spending time one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, the Japanese boy who um, you know, could have told all about what the Japanese what the was what were doing, and could told all about things like the, 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 the kamikaze, uh, etc., etc. It's and that boy eventually went back to Japan. He made it back to Japan, where he's famous as the boy who lived and they got it wrong with the Pope. He goes around telling everyone he lived with the Pope for years, and, and that's followed up in many many Japanese texts. However, Cardinal Bellamine Bellamino is the one who conducts these um, investigations eventually would conclude heliocentricity is incompatible with scripture and therefore it cannot be accepted. The English are taking out their telescope, therefore, partly to show this is the latest thing, maybe it'll be useful to you in battle, but also to say, those Jesuits who've been walking around your country for the last 50 or 60 years teaching you modern stuff, and the Japanese were extremely interested in astronomy, as the Chinese would be. It's absolutely crucial in East Asian thought to predict eclipses. And there was a lot of problem within East Asian um, uh, astronomy of doing that. The Jesuits turn up and they can do it much more effectively. So that above all what the Japanese want to learn from the Europeans, you know, whether they're Christians or not, is astronomy. And the Je English can say, use this telescope. Everything they've told you, the basis of what they've told you, is incorrect. And of course, if they can do this, then the uh, Japanese will be, um, the Jesuits will be highly compromised, and they might even be expelled. At any rate, the English will get a status in Japan which will allow them, above all, to trade. They're not trying to 
turn the Japanese into Church of England worshippers or anything. It doesn't matter. They just want privileges to trade and they want to get the other Westerners out because Japan probably doesn't produce enough silver or anything that all the European countries can be exporting it. There's only going to be a limited amount of exports and the English want to be the ones to be sure that they have it. So we imagine the Shogun's father in, um, in this castle, Simple Castle, Chisora Castle, is hearing all these things. Maybe he even has the thing proved to him a few cloudless nights with a telescope, and he begins to think to himself, um, what is the value of having these Jesuits in this country? If they're not even teaching us proper stuff, and the fact that, uh, like everywhere, the Roman Catholics are always accused, probably falsely in most cases, of dual loyalties, do you follow the king, or do you follow the pope? And Japan is trying to emerge from civil war, so the breaking up of civil authority is the big thing they're trying to overcome in the establishment of this new shogunate. The English are putting a spanner in the works for their other European rivals. At any rate, the, shogun, uh, the shogun, ex-shogun in retirement says, my son is notional shogun, so you better go along to him and he will give you formal permission to trade. And I hope you've got a nice present for him too. And fortunately, they did have another present, which was a beautiful goblet. That's a good kind of golden goblet. Uh, so the shogun gets that, and the shogun says, I must give you a reciprocal present because you're so nice to give me the golden goblet, and he gives a suit of armour. In fact, he gives two suits of armour. These who eventually would come back to England, and one of them would be given to King James, who would put it in his kind of like secondary mansion, which is now King James's palace. And what did he decide to do? He decided to copy his wife's father, who was the king of Denmark, I told you, and build an English chamber, uh, an Indian chamber. So James I had an Indian cabinet, he called it, in his palace, which, as far as I've been able to discover, actually contained Japanese things, including one of the two suits of armour. Other things as well. Um, the, uh, came from other sources. The other suit of armour went into the Tower of London, because the Tower of London at that time was an armoury. And guess what? It's sitting there, like that coach in the Kremlin. It's never moved. Parts of the Tower of London has burnt down, but that uh, has, is still there, and it's been recently restored. It looks very nice, as you can see. But the shogun says, well, actually, my father is in control, so you better go back to him and ask him for formal permission. So they go back a final time, and while they've been making this additional trip, the former shogun, who really rules, has prepared a present to give to the King of England in response for the telescope. And he gives not... Armaments, the shogun, after all, is a military figure. Giving a suit of armour is very appropriate. The ex-shogun is in retirement, so he wouldn't give weaponry. He gives art. He gives ten paintings. Japanese screens, as you probably know. Japanese screens, you know, they sit on the floor, beautiful zigzag things. They come in pairs. So he gives five pairs. And we only know them as um, paintings done on gold, which is what the Japanese record says, were made. Something like this. Sorry, it's very generic picture, but a pair of beautiful gold screens. I'm sure you've seen such things. Uh, and uh, these are then loaded onto the ship with a suit of armour, with a beautiful huge document authorising the English to trade in Japan, and they're all taken back to England. And they arrive safely in England. And um, the head of this mission, I didn't give you his name, but in case you're interested, his name is John Probably he should pronounce it John Sayers, S-A-Y-E-R-S. But he himself wrote it S-A-R-I-S. So people today often pronounce his name Cyrus or Sayers. Anyway, Sayers had the idea that since we got, we got armour, we got lots of screens. The King of England is going to have loads of screens. They're bound to become really popular amongst the aristocracy. We can sell for a lot of money. So he buys lots of extra screens off the peg to take back to England too. And obviously lacquer, because everyone already knows Japanese lacquer is so valuable. So these things arrive back in England. Just after he's left Japan, only within weeks, the shogun says, that's it for the Jesuits. And it is the first code to expel, expel what the Japanese call the bateren. Japanese word for Roman Catholic priest is bateren, because uh, they take the Japanese word, the Spanish word padre. Right, padre, Japanese is bateren. And the bateren svihore, the, the injunction to expel the, um, the, the, the priests is issued just after the English have done all this stuff. All right. And it's a very sad story for the um, evangelism of Japan. If you support the evangelism of Japan, it 
came to a very sticky end shortly afterwards. But anyway, the ship going the other direction, they don't know this, they merrily go back to London. And arriving in London then is um, ten or five pairs of screens for the king, two suits of armour, some other screens which the company will sell, and some lacquer. And obviously on the way back they stopped in Java, so piles of pepper and a um, certain amount of Chinese silk they bought along the way, and those things as well. The screens that went to the king um, had to be ten, because the document says ten. But Sir Thomas Smith had to look at them and says, the screens which are sent unto his majesty are not so good as some of those which the company have, the other ones they bought. Not above two or three should be presented to his majesty, using some of the best that the company should have instead. Now you can be sure that the ex-shogun commissioned the best possible screens to the gift of the King of England. And you can be sure that John Cyrus, down in the marketplace, bought some really grubby second-tier ones, and someone switched them around. Right? It would be really interesting to know on what grounds, you know, on what aesthetic criteria this decision was made. Of course, it's possible some had more gold. It's possible that some had themes which were more sort of appropriate to European consumption. Uh, you know, the, I just showed you one of Birds and Flowers. Birds and Flowers is a very uh, elite theme in Japanese art, but Westerners might have thought it was a little bit, you know, not very robust. Uh, possibly pictures of hunting or, or horses would have been more desirable. There's a lot of speculation about that. But what we do know is the ones that went to the king, he got them. And we know he got them because when Oliver Cromwell sold off the royal collection during the Commonwealth period, and they kept careful documentation of all things sold off, we see Japanese screens sold. Um, the ones that, which went for sale in London, uh, they were sold at auction. It's one of the first art auctions that ever took place in English history. And we have the list of painting subjects, as an English person who didn't know wrote them down. So pictures of horses, pictures of battle, pictures of fowl, birds and flowers probably. Uh, and we have the price that they sold for, and we have the purchaser. Amazing record, right? And the prices are round about 8 to 10 pounds. And they sell both halves of the screen separately. So if you'd bought the whole screen, that's £20. £20 is amazingly expensive. You could buy a Caravaggio in London at the time for £20. Right. So these things are not just like funny stuff from foreign places. They're very, very highly regarded. The fact the king has them, of course, makes them even more so. They also sell off all the lacquer. And again, we have the descriptions, but it's just very vague. Casket, inlaid or not inlaid, etc. The prices, again, same sort of prices. And the purchases. But the only people who can bid at these East India Company auctions are the people who invested in the voyage. So they're not necessarily the end users. They would have sold them on or given them on or something, right? So, in fact, the list of purchases are not that useful, but quite interesting to see. Uh, none of the screens at all survived because a Japanese screen hung on the wall in a kind of climate like you have or like we have doesn't last very long. Um, but the lacquer lasts much longer and the... Uh, one of the most senior court figures who had been instrumental in helping the East India Company come into existence died in 1611 as the ship's going out. When they come back, surely they would have come back with a wonderful present for this person, who was the Lord Treasurer of England, which means the highest person in the government. He's dead. So probably, I think, they'd have given it to his son. And his son is still going strong, family's still there. In the original house they still had, and this lacquer cabinet is still sitting there. Hatfield House outside London, in case you ever want to go. So I'm sure this came back on that ship. The family say they've had it forever, but no, we don't know. The other things, bits and bobs, many things have come back. The other, some of the screens might have been so good, whatever. They go for sale where? And this is the last slide I'll show you, and then we'll stop. At that building I already mentioned to you, the Royal Exchange, not far from Charing Cross Station. The king had been there for the grand opening in May 1609. And now we're talking about 1611, the ship goes, it arrives in Japan in 1613, it gets back to London at the very end of 1614. So probably just into New Year 1615, these things are being um, sold. And the East India Company had an outlet in the new exchange in which they dealt with more minor kinds of Japanese things. Probably the huge aristocratic 
things, paintings and lacquer, they would be sold by some sort of private agreement. But they came back, we know, also with Japanese fans. Everyone comes back from Japan with fans, bits of paper, little bits of lacquer that weren't very expensive, spoons and stuff. And of course, being English, they commissioned Japanese lacquer beer tankards, one of which survives today in the Victorian Albert Museum. The building actually was never built quite like this. Inigo Jones, the first English architect to study in Italy, was commissioned to design it. And he, built it so, he designed it so flamboyantly that they didn't ever quite make it like this. But it was supposed to be uh, you know, a, a, a truly stunning new experience where courtiers and um, wealthy townspeople could go together and where men and women could also go. Ladies, of course, did not go shopping. A shop came to a lady's house. Here it was understood to be appropriate for women without scandal to their reputations to be seen um, shopping. And with it, I think I can say, begins the whole history, although the English are later, there are already a few, few things like this in, in Spain and Italy, but it begins the whole history of London as a centre of uh, commercial shopping life. So I've gone a bit over my allotted time, I'm sorry about that, but uh, um, if there's any questions, that, then thank you.